Chaslensique eh, Shekai Kumod, compañeras y compañeras de la Nación Académica. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for being here. Uh, so this talk is very interesting for me, mainly because when I prepare for a talk, I think about my audience, right? Uh, so I have you all, the audience who are physically present uh, in this room, and then we have the YouTubers, right? People who may or may not see this video. Uh, so for me, it's very interesting to kind of, it's it, it, like to how to prepare this talk, right? Um, and I'll get into that in a second. Uh, so for today, my talk is divided into three parts. Uh, the first has to do with methodology and how I position myself, right? How my personal experiences really shape the type of research that I do. Uh, second, I'll provide a little bit of uh, historical context um, in Guatemala and in the Shil region where I conducted uh, research through this concept known as the four invasions. And again, I'll get to that in a second. And lastly, I'll provide a case study of uh, a conflict involving the construction of a hydroelectric dam and the Shil Mayan communities of Cozal, uh, which is located in the Western Highlands of Guatemala, right? Uh, so a little bit about myself, right? Who is this long-haired guy in front of you, right, with a weird beard? Um, my name is Gio Batts, right? Um, I was born and raised in Los Angeles, California, in the territory known today as the United States. Uh, my parents migrated from Guatemala to the U.S. in the early 80s. Um, I come from an immigrant working class background, right? So my mom cleaned houses when I was a kid, and she still cleans houses today, right? Um, uh, growing up in California in the late 80s and early 1990s, uh, there was a strong anti-immigrant sentiment, right? We had Governor Pete Wilson, who was promoting the very racist and anti-immigrant uh, Proposition 187, right? Um, so growing up in LA, uh, I was confronted with a lot of discrimination and racism, right? Uh, especially if you were from an immigrant background like myself. Um, so it was those personal experiences that really created this very angry youth, right? So a lot of us grow up angry uh, in urban environments, right? And that can manifest itself in very self-destructive behavior, or it could be a source of empowerment, right? To change the system that drives us this way, right? Um, when I was growing up in LA, I also wondered why my name, Bats, right? Why, why, what the hell is a Bats, right? Why aren't I a Gonzalez, a Gutierrez, or Lopez, right? Why don't I have a stereotypical Latino name, right? Uh, a lot of people, when they see my name, Giovanni, the Italian, right, uh, origin, uh, we figured that Christopher Columbus stole all our land so we could at least steal one of their names, right? Uh, so Giovanni, first name, and Bats, a lot of people think it's uh, of German origin, right? Uh, but Bats, through my personal inquiries, is actually a Quiche Mayan name, right? It's a very ancient name that is part of the Mayan calendar, right? Uh, and it's actually spelled as a glyph. The Spanish just butchered our names, right? Um, so when a lot of people think about Giovanni Bats, they don't expect this, right? So growing up, I went through this identity crisis like most people do. Um, and little by little, I engaged in this lifelong journey of recovering my quiche and my roots, right? I felt that something was missing, right? Something was lost. There was something inside of me um, that was speaking to me, right? Um, so in Spanish, we say la, la sangre llama, right? La tierra llama. Uh, so there was something like in me that wanted me to kind of recover my, my roots, right? Uh, other important um, identities that are important for my positionality and the work that I do I'm a U.S. citizen. I became a Guatemalan citizen in 2015. Uh, I'm a heterosexual male, um, and uh, and I'll get into why that's relevant later on. Uh, so, um, my original research project had to do with how Mayan youth identify themselves, right? How do indigenous peoples negotiate Latinidad, right? Because at the end of the day, Latino and Hispanic identity is European in origin, right? It really marginalizes and hides uh, and represses indigenous cultures and identities, right? Um, so my original research project was on that. Uh, I started doing my master's and PhD at the University of Texas in Austin. Uh, and in 2011, I got the opportunity to do two months of field research looking into the legal principle of prior consultation, right, FPIC, um, and how that played into conflicts between hydroelectric dams and, and, um, and indigenous communities in Guatemala. Uh, so I was like, hey, like, like trip to, the, to Guatemala, the motherland, let's do it, right? Um, uh, so I was prepared to go to this place called Alta Verapaz uh, to look at a dam called Rio Chisoy. When I got there in June of 2011, um, there was actually a fiscal, uh, a, a member of the attorney general's office who was actually killed um, at this site. The lawyer who was my contact in Guatemala told me it was way too dangerous to go there, but he knew a friend who knew a friend who was working with the communities in Cozal, 
um, who were involved in a, uh, in a dialogue with a, a company building a dam. Um, so basically, I went with him, right? I was preparing for uh, another place. Uh, so, Quetzal, so I traveled to Quetzal in 2011. Uh, this is a map of Guatemala, right? It's the country under Mexico. Uh, the, I don't have a pointer. Uh, <laughs> Quetzal is located in the Western Highlands of Guatemala, right? So the Western Highlands is where the majority of the indigenous populations live today. 60% uh, of the Guatemalan population is of Maya origin. There's 23 uh, indigenous groups in Guatemala, 21 being Mayan uh, descent, Xinca and then Garifuna. Um, and then we have mestizos, which are mixed bloods, and, um, and the Guatemalan Euro elite, right? So European descendants uh, who basically own everything. Um, so Quetzal forms part of the Ishio region. So right here to the right, you'll see uh, the Department of Quiche. Departments function like states. Um, so the Ishio region is consisted of Chahul, Quetzal, and Neva. I'm right there, the one that's kind of the smaller one on the right, right? So I show up in 2011. Um, there's this dialogue between a company and, and Quetzal. I don't know what the hell is going on. I'm there for five hours. I don't know anyone. Um, and after this meeting, this lawyer introduces me to these community leaders um, and asks them if it's okay for me to do research there, right? So I stay there for two months, um, and I fall in love with the place, right? Not in a very romantic way. I just felt that there was like a legit struggle going on there, and I was really... Um, a, I was really uh, wanting to work with these community leaders, right? So I did my research there, uh, met some people, and asked permission to come back in 2012 to present my results. Uh, it's there where I decided to change my research project, right, from doing my youth to working with mega projects, right? So for anyone who's involved in the PhD program, changing those projects, right, the literature and everything uh, involved with that was very difficult, but I felt that it was a struggle that I wanted to contribute in any way possible, right? Um, so again, my... Um, my desire to pursue social justice really um, provided me a, a, a desire to, to work with people, right, um, in a very respectful manner. A uh, little stats about Quetzal, 84% of the population lives in poverty, 29% lives in extreme poverty, 41% uh, of the population above the age of 15 are literate. Not saying that if you, if you don't know how to read and write, you can't produce knowledge. It's just very important to have those uh, facts, especially when we're talking about corporations that make you sign things, right? Um, a little bit about my methodology. Uh, when I came back in 2012, um, that's when I had a serious discussion with uh, the community leaders uh, and the ancestral authorities uh, as to how I could conduct my research. Uh, we agreed that I was going to come back in 2013 to do an ethnography. Uh, so I lived in the community of San Felipe Chenla, and I'll explain what that is in a second. Uh, so my methodology is, is ethnography, right, the tool of the anthropologist. Uh, so I conducted over 90 uh, formal interviews, a lot more informal interviews, uh, particip uh, participant observation, right? So I lived in uh, Quetzal for 26 months, right? I almost didn't come back to the US, but I, I had to, I guess, I don't know. Um, and I also did uh, archival research, right? So I looked at thousands of documents uh, looking from the colonial period all the way up to today. Um, I am influenced and inspired by critical indigenous and decolonial methodologies, right? So Linda Smith's decolonizing methodologies, uh, uh, Florence Mallon's edited book of uh, decolonizing native histories, right? And I'm also very interested in activist anthropology and research, right? How social movements could produce knowledges, right? Um, there's this belief in academia that objectivity is real, right? For me, objectivity is obviously not real, and I'm always reminded when I read about the Spanish colonization and how angry I get, right? It just really messes up my mood. Um, so how, as researchers, we could contribute to uh, social movements, right? Through our positions, right? So uh, is a PhD just something that gives me a DR dot, or is it a piece of paper that could help me um, uh, or uh, serve as a tool, right? Um, so I'm really inspired by activist anthropology, um, and it's through those two fact, uh, sources of literature that really uh, led me to um, have the communities of Quetzal really shape my research agenda and questions, right? And I'm also inspired by Clara Coyoishkot. Maybe you've never heard of her. She's my grandma, mi abuelita, right? Uh, so she's a 97 rebellious Quiche woman who always taught me to keep it real, right? Um, so letting your emotions and kind of personal experiences really guide uh, the work that you're doing, right? That if you're committed to a struggle, um, you know, then, then just, um, um, you know, this is very important as well, right? Anyway, so going back to 2012, uh, this is a picture right here. Sorry, I have two computers. Um, right here, uh, left top corner, that's when I had short hair. Um, a little skinnier too. Uh, that's when I met with the uh, ancestral authorities and basically had them 
um, uh, give feedback to my, my research agenda, right? So I wanted to look at the conflict between the dam and the communities of Quetzal uh, that was going at the, at the time. Uh, but one thing the community leaders really wanted me to focus on was history, right? So they're like, uh, these plantations owners came here in the early 19th, 20th century, um, but we don't know how, right? We don't know how they came in uh, and took all our lands. We just know that they did, right? Um, so as a result of that, uh, my project uh, is also very historical, right? So even though I'm a trained anthrop anthropologist, I'm really a historian at heart. Um, um, so I, I came up with this, the saying, compromiso is compromiso, right? So um, I just didn't want to get my degree um, and get a tenure track position, which is very rare right now. I'm on job market, so if you guys know anything, please let me know. Um, so I just didn't want to do my research and just leave, right? Especially because uh, for a long time, indigenous activists and scholars have criticized uh, academics, particularly anthropologists, for just going in, taking information, writing your book, and that's it, right? Call it a day. We're, we're here, um, um, you're right. Um, and this was reinforced in Quetzal when people said anthropologists solo sacan información y se van, right? So they just take out information and they leave. Um, so a lot of information is out there about the Ishu region, but a lot of the Ishulis don't know about it. Um, so throughout the research project, uh, I would always give updates to the leaders um, about my work, my interviews, how things were going. Uh, so that's a picture of me kind of giving a, a summary. Uh, for my dissertation defense, before I defended in the ivory tower, I said it's very important to go back to the communities and, and present my work, right? Even though it was in English, it was an oral defense. Uh, so that's me in March of 2017 um, giving my, my dissertation defense. And then uh, for my actual dissertation defense within uh, the prison that is the ivory tower, I invited two ancestral authorities who were right there in the kind of red coats um, to make sure I was in line, right? Because that's another... Um, believe, right? Anthropologists just lie. They make things up. Um, just to show some pictures of my research, right? Just, um, um, I was very heavily involved, right? I hiked through mountains. I did a lot of accompanying with a, a lot of leaders, right? So meeting with high-level government officials, documenting a lot of things, recording things at the request. Um, I was able to bring, uh, on six different occasions, uh, issue leaders to the U.S. to do human rights awareness campaigns, right? Um, so it wasn't just me doing research and recording, right? I wanted to be involved in any way possible. I got on a motorcycle, which I miss very much because I had to sell it when I left. I grew corn, uh, you know, participated in roadblocks and, 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 um, and protests and things like that, right? Um, again, positionality is all about being self-reflexive and not so much self-obsessive, right? Um, I just mentioned this mainly because as I go through my pre the rest of my presentation, um, I mentioned these personal experiences not to garner sympathy, uh, or romanticize a lot of these struggles is, again, just to keep it real, right? That these are things that are going on right now, right? Um, since I've been here at SAR for the last month and a half, there have been two Ishu leaders who have been brutally murdered, right? So on a daily basis, people are risking their lives um, 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 for survival, right? Um, so I'm in a weird position where I feel kind of guilty uh, for being here and talking about this while my friends are, are out there, right, um, on a daily basis. Uh, so a little bit of the historical context of Quetzal. Um, again, I really look at uh, Malin's decolonizing native histories to look at um, decolonizing history, right? So not taking this nationalistic approach of Guatemalan history, right? So I try to privilege uh, local level interpretations of histories. Uh, for the Ishilas, they talk about invasions, right? Um, they don't talk about set Spanish settlement or colonization. They talk about Spanish European invasion, which still is ongoing, right? Um, so they divide time up into four uh, parts, right? So this is a banner, for instance, from a youth group in Neva, um, where they outline these four invasions, right? So the first one, obviously, being European-Spanish invasion. Um, the second being the arrival of plant coffee plantations and labor plantations in the late, uh, earliest, uh, late 19th century, early 20th century, the Guatemalan Civil War, and, of course, uh, the mega projects, right? So that's kind of the new invasion. Um, so for the first invasion, obviously, hopefully you all are aware that the Spanish came over, right? <laughs> um, during the first invasion, obviously, there was genocide. There's also something called the spiritual conquest, where these Catholic priests um, basically centralized uh, indigenous populations in Quetzal and formed congregaciones, right? Uh, so they forced people to go to church. They forced them to build a church over sacred sites, um, build a plaza, etc., um, they were forced to give tribute, right? So chickens, honey, chili, cotton, and also give uh, forced labor. Um, and something very interesting about the Ishu region is that Europeans actually didn't settle there um, in the Western Highlands in particular until the coffee plantations, right? So for a while, 
um, the place was autonomous with the exception of um, the tribute that they had to give, right, and, and dealing with the, the Catholic priest. During the second invasion, this is the liberal era, right? So um, coffee, um, which is a, a drug I need on a daily basis, right? So I feel guilty to drink coffee as well. Um, the introduction of coffee in Central America, first in Costa Rica, later on in, in Guatemala, um, leads to the creation of, uh, of coffee plantations and the need for labor. Uh, Justo Rofino Barrios, who has this big beard right there, um, he starts um, giving out land titles to ex-military members and Europeans, basically, right? Um, there was this idea that Indians, right, didn't know how to manage land, that they couldn't produce uh, these lands in a very profitable manner, right? So this is known as the Indian problem, right? So marginalized groups are always viewed as, the, as a problem, right? Um, so there was a debate between genocide and assimilation going on in Guatemala. Um, it's during this time that non-indigenous people started um, invading uh, Cozal. Uh, at this point in time, Cozal had communal land, right? So it's known as a nejido. Um, but through deceptive means or just illegal acts through land grants, um, the use of alcohol to get people drunk and sign over the land, uh, the use of debt, um, people started losing the best lands, right? So this is a map of the Ishio region, right? So those three towns, the three municipalities that I had mentioned before. Uh, this is taken from Elaine Elliott's unpublished work on land tenure in the Ishio region. Um, so if you look at San Juan Cozal, um, each of those numbers and, and, and squares um, represents a finca, right? So a, a plantation. Um, so little by little, uh, they took the best lands, right? So these Europeans, uh, 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 Spanish, Italians, and other non-indigenous peoples came to Cozal uh, and basically uh, took the best lands, right? Uh, during this time, there was also forced labor laws. Um, so if you didn't own land because you were just displaced on it, you were forced to go back on the plantation and work for free, right? Not without any payment. Uh, one of the most nefarious uh, finca owners or plantation owners is the Brol family. Uh, there is an Italian immigrant by the name of Pedro Brol, who in 1902 came to Cozal, uh, bribed the mayor for, uh, well, allegedly, according to the Ishilas, bribed the mayor um, into giving him some land, and little by little, he ate up uh, the best uh, lands located in the valley of Cozal. Uh, he produces, that finca of San Francisco is still in operation, producing organic coffee, which, from my understanding, goes to Starbucks. Um, uh, so organic is, this doesn't necessarily mean it has, well, anyways. Um, during this time, throughout Guatemala, um, land was being eaten up. So by 1950, 72% of land was owned by the two rich, 2% 2 of the richest families, right? So it was like 21 or 22 families in Guatemala uh, who owned most of the land, right? Um, in 1952, there was an agrarian reform by a democratically elected government, Jacobo Arbenz. Um, as a result of this agrarian reform, the U.S. Uh, helped sponsor uh, a coup a CIA back coup, uh, which led into decades of violence. Uh, so as a result of this land conflict and tensions, um, this leads to the third invasion, right? So the Guatemalan Civil War, which lasted officially from 1960 to 1996. Again, some Ishilas say the war never uh, ended, right? The war continues. Um, during this time, a UN uh, United Nations-sponsored Truth Commission found that 200 people died during the war. 83% of the people who were victims of this, uh, these deaths were indigenous. The military was responsible for 93% of these deaths, right? Uh, the guerrilla, I think, were accused of 2%, and the rest are unknown. 1.5 million people were displaced. There were 669 massacres that occurred in the country. 114 of those massacres uh, occurred in the Ishil region, right? The Ishilas at this point are about like 2% of the population, right? So the, the, the genocide that occurred in the Ishil region uh, was devastating. No one was untouched. Um, there was uh, a U.S. back scorched earth policies in the early 1980s where the idea was just burn everything, right? Um, and then victims were concentrated into what they call model villages, which were financed by uh, U.S. evangelicals and Protestants. Um, so again, the U.S. has a lot of connections with Guatemala and in Central America, which is, if you look at the news today, um, the caravans and whatnot, that's partly due to a lot of these foreign policies that, that um, were really devastating for these communities. Uh, I have some pictures here. Some of them show dead bodies, so I do apologize, but it's always important to kind of show these pictures. Um, a lot of these pictures are from Jean Marie Simon, a photographer, uh, one of the few photographers that were able to uh, go to the Ishil region during this time. Um, um, anyway, so this is some of the images of, 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 of the Guatemalan Civil War. So, right here, um, this is a model village, right? People, survivors of massacres were concentrated uh, into these little towns. This was, from my understanding, uh, based off of the hamlets in Vietnam. Um, 
um, there was a lot of orphans that were left, right? Um, if you look at the top right corner, uh, that military uh, person right there is in Guatemalan. He's actually a U.S. citizen, right? So the U.S. Uh, was heavily involved in, uh, um, in, 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 in the massacres that occurred in Guatemala. There's a lot of declassified CIA cables uh, and other uh, U.S. documents uh, that demonstrate that the U.S. Um, had a role in this, right? They, they, we, uh, the U.S. has a lot of blood in its hands. I hope that's not a surprise. Um, the person right there with the beard right there, his name is Tito Arias. He was the commander of the Ishio region. Uh, so we have the intellectual authors of genocide being the U.S. and the Guatemalan government. Um, but this individual right here was actually there, right, torturing and killing, and people still remember him. Uh, that person in real life, his name is Otto Perez Molina, and he was elected president in 2012 of Guatemala, right? Just to show you what kind of country Guatemala is, right? Um, um, he had to resign in 2015, um, not because of his role in, in massacres, but, um, but for corruption charges. Um, this is a picture I took of uh, exhumation, right? So the Guatemalan Civil War happened in the 80s, but a lot of people, uh, it's a fresh wound, right? Uh, this was a very traumatic experience. Um, so during this exhumation, for instance, um, that I visited in Chisis, uh, Cozal, there was nine bodies that were taken out uh, by forensic anthropologists. Uh, this is considered a crime scene. Um, seven of those, uh, sorry, did I say, yeah, there was uh, 11 people who were there, sorry. Um, Two of those people were uh, adult women, two of those other people were adult men, uh, and the rest were children, right, who were burned alive. Um, people, uh, survivors of massacres came back and, 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 and did this grave, right, this common grave. Um, but just to show you all that um, children were, of course, victims of this, uh, the one that was on top um, is too young to identify the gender uh, and among other things, right? So people, uh, and when I, took these pi when I took this picture, there was a bunch of other kids looking at this, right? Um, uh, so that it was, it's very difficult, right? Um, so these are pictures from the war, and these are pictures from today, right? Um, these are all, they, there's not much difference, right? Even the actors involved. Uh, all of these pictures come from people who were protesting a mega project, right? Uh, so right here, Otto Perez Molina, the guy with the beard, when he was president, did a state of siege in order to um, uh, uh, squash a uh, protest against uh, hydroelectric dam that they were building in Santa Cruz uh, Varias. Um, this is a massacre in Totonicapan, which occurred uh, in 2013, where six uh, protesters were killed, right? So people say this was the first massacre after the war. Um, these two pictures up here on the top right, um, that's a protest uh, by the Shinkas, uh, another non mayan indigenous group who are protesting the mine, and then the cement company, right? So there isn't a lot of difference. That's why a lot of people say um, the invasion never stopped, right? It's just time is cyclical, things repeat itself, the same actors are involved. Um, and it's important to note that the Broll family, right, this Italian uh, immigrant who came to the, uh, the Ishio region in the early 20th century, um, they helped the military in committing massacres, right? Uh, and this is very important, mainly because the dam that will be constructed um, is constructed on this plantation, right? So it's, it's all um, related, right? So for the Ishilas and other indigenous groups, uh, the fourth invasion is obviously mega projects that could be mines, uh, uh, hydroelectric dams, um, but also uh, logging, illegal logging, among other things. Um, so people are combating this right now. So what happened in Kotsal? Uh, in the early 2000s, there was an idea to build uh, an Italian company by the name of Enel, uh, got into contact with Pedro Brol, uh, the grandson of the original Brol. Um, and they decided to try to build a dam in, in Kotsal. Um, in 2008, people learned about this uh, planned construction and they basically just rejected the project, right? Um, but at the end of the day, these are just a bunch of Indians, so it doesn't matter. Uh, the construction of this dam was gonna go uh, either way. Um, so in 2008, uh, the construction of the dam began. Uh, people started protesting um, through marches, through uh, requests to the municipal mayor to meet um, with the company in order to talk about uh, the potential damages uh, or benefits that this may bring. Uh, but in response to that, the mayor at the time um, started persecuting a lot of the leaders who were requesting a meeting with this uh, company, right? So instead of talking, right, the response was violence. Um, at this point in time, there was death threats that were going around, um, among other things. Um, while they were building this construction, while they were building the dam, uh, the finca owner, Pedro Bro, the, the grandson of the original plantation owner, started going around different parts of the town and started promising schools, electricity, etc. 
Uh, so this is an act, for instance, that, that um, uh, documents his false promises, right? Um, because the dam, uh, the company who built this dam had no intention in giving electricity to the people, right? 37% uh, of uh, Kotsal has access to electricity, right? So a lot of people wanted uh, this service, right? Um, and rightfully so, right? Um, uh, the dam, while they were construction, constructing the dam, unlike other uh, hydroelectric projects, people weren't displaced, right? So sometimes people are, are displaced in order to create these, these projects. Um, this one was a weird one, mainly because it was construction on private property. Uh, but there were still kind of unknown environmental factors, one of them being the contamination of the river after um, the water flows through this dam. Uh, so this is in Uspantan, right after the river. Uh, so this community leader, he's Kekchi, uh, says that when they were constructing the dam, the river would get dirty, right? So these are rivers that are really clean and pristine, but for some reason, for two, three hours uh, a day, or sometimes for a full day, the river would turn like this. Um, this is when I visited in 2014 to this community, um, and it was really weird. The river looked like that, and then all of a sudden it got really dirty for no reason. Um, these were fishing communities, uh, so they said the fish have all died out, um, and other, uh, 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 other species that lived in the river. Um, a lot of community leaders talk about their kids going into the river and getting rashes or warts and things like that, right? And to this day, they say they don't know uh, what caused this contamination, right? But they know that it started once the dam was being constructed, right? Uh, unfortunately, um, when these mega projects are being um, considered, there has to be an environmental impact assessment, right, the EIA. Um, but unfortunately, these documents are thousands of pages long, very technical language, and they're very inaccessible, right? Uh, so I've been trying for years to get a copy of it, and it's very difficult. Um, they, I think they charge uh, hundreds of dollars in order for you to get a copy of that. Um, so a lot of leaders don't know what's going on, right? So this was part of the problem, is that a lot of the communities of Kotsal didn't know what was going to be the impact of this dam. Um, anyway, so for, after years of trying to peacefully uh, get into contact with the, the company, um, the communities of Kotsal decided to do, uh, engage in Pacific resistance through a blockade. Uh, so they blocked the main road that leads to the dam, right? So Kotsal is a very small town, very mountainous, so there's just one road that leads to the, the plantation. Uh, so they blocked it in San Felipe Chenla, which is where I uh, conducted my research, where I lived uh, for over two years. Um, so the whole community got together. They're like, we, we need to shut this down, right, in order to stop construction. Uh, the then president of Guatemala, Alvaro Colom, um, gave a speech where he basically associated people uh, as being savages and terrorists, right? Uh, so people were being called names that were uh, these, uh, these terms like savages and, and terrorists which was justified in their um, uh, repression during the Civil War, right? So people were very angered um, by the words of the president at the time. And then nine of the leaders of Kotsal who were heavily involved uh, in this blockade and peaceful resistance uh, had arrest warrants issued, right, at the request of the company building the dam, right? Um, so nine of the uh, leaders were charged with um, creating death threats, supposedly, um, uh, terrorism, among other things, right? Um, Here's some pictures of, oh, and, and then, uh, so during this time, uh, so this was in January of 2011, the communities uh, were again requesting a meeting with the company. At this point in time, the municipal mayor is no longer in the picture, mainly because he's a fugitive for torturing and killing a police officer, right? He lynched a police officer. So there was this kind of local power vacuum that was going on. Um, the Ishiles weren't uh, ending with the blockade, so in uh, March, 20, uh, March 18, 2011, um, the Guatemalan government responds with violence, right? So 700,000 policemen and soldiers, along with three helicopters, come to Kotsal, um, where they basically want to end the blockade and arrest these nine leaders, right? Um, uh, so you can see here some pictures. This is taken from a video. Uh, some of these pictures are taken from a video um, that shows how they came, right, uh, to this community. Um, a lot of people, a lot of people who were uh, old enough to remember the war um, had nervous breakdowns, right? There was two women who fainted, right? So this is a very traumatic experience that occurred. Uh, survivors of massacres were reminded of the war. Um, and again, this was a psychological warfare, right? Um, uh, amazingly enough, the community got together and they were actually able to push the police officers uh, and the armed forces back, right? So they actually retreated. So in this video, um, people were very calm and they pushed them out after a two hour standoff. Um, and if you know anything about Guatemala, that's very rare, right? That doesn't usually happen as I showed those other pictures, right? Usually bullets are shot and things like that. So the communities um, were able to gain a victory at that point. Um, the company at this point had no other 
uh, um, choice but to basically sit down, right? Uh, so they signed this agreement where they're going to start dialogue. It's not negotiation. It's just basically people getting together and talking. Um, so after four months of blockade, in May 2011, uh, Enel, again, this uh, Italian corporation, uh, uh, their representatives talked with the communities of Quetzal. Um, these, this dialogue was conducted in public in Quetzal. Uh, Enel's officials wanted to do it in the city in private offices, and basically that was to bribe the leaders, right? So some of the leaders told me, yeah, we were offered these things, um, but we needed to be transparent with the communities, otherwise, you know, we would be viewed as sellouts. Um, so the demands of Quetzal in this dialogue was uh, basically 20% of the energy produced of, uh, from this dam was going to be left in, in, in Quetzal. Um, they wanted pavement uh, on their road, right, because uh, there's dirt roads over there. Uh, Eight million Quetzales, which is about a little over a million dollars um, that would go to local development projects um, and a creation of a commission that was going to look at the damages that was caused by the dams, right? So the contamination of the river, for instance, would be an example of um, needing attention, right? Um, there's in the saying that el, uh, el tiempo es el enemigo del pueblo, right? So time is the enemy of the people. Uh, what we didn't know at the time was that Enel was buying time, right? in order to finish the construction of the dam. I believe that at this point in time when they started dialogue, the dam was already 90% constructed, right? Uh, so once they engaged the dialogue, they were allowed, uh, Enel was allowed to continue with building this dam. Um, and eventually, after enough time, uh, Enel actually just stopped the dialogue, right? So they were like, we're, even though they signed an agreement to talk, right, they just stopped showing up to Cozal. Um, uh, during this time, there was a, uh, an election campaign. There was a, it was elections at that point, right? So they were going to elect a new mayor. Uh, so Anel, um, after this new mayor gets elected, has meetings in secret uh, with this incoming mayor. Um, um, there's allegations that the company actually funded uh, the campaign for this candidate. Uh, and on March 12, 2013, out of nowhere, uh, there was an announcement that there was going to be this big signing in the Capitol involving this, this dam, right? So uh, the mayor struck a deal. Um, that was mediated by Otto Perez Molina. So there's, again, the, 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 the commander of the Shu region during the war signing this agreement. Uh, Gustavo Porras is on his left. He used to be a guerrilla member, but he sold out. Um, and he's working in, uh, in close collaboration with corporations. Um, so they signed this deal uh, where they basically increased the amount of money that the company leaves to the municipality, right? So they used to give 800,000 quetzales um, to, the, to the municipality. That went up to million quetzales a year. Um, a lot of people don't know what happens to this money, right? Um, you, most of the times it just gets pocketed. Um, and as a result of this agreement, uh, the communities of Quetzal and their movement kind of died down, right? They, they were kind of taken aback by this. Um, so the movement kind of uh, faded for, for a while, right? So they feel like they lost a battle um, at this point in time, right? So the, the communities didn't organize strongly against the dam. The dam comes into operation in 2013. Um, there's estimates that the dam generates about 30 to $40 million a year, right? Uh, this is a place where people, if you have employment, gain about three, four dollars a day, right? 37% of the population still only has electricity, right? So a lot of people don't have it. Um, there's people who tell me they live four kilometers from this dam and they still don't have electricity, right? So you see this huge thing, right? Um, there are villages that have electrical like posts, but no electricity, right? Um, these posts are painted with a lot of uh, political propaganda uh, from different political parties uh, that, that go in every four years. Um, so a lot of people ask development, right? These are supposedly development projects, uh, but people always ask development for who, right? Um, it's like for people like us, right? We have technology, we have these uh, um, rich natural resources that we need for our computers, our cell phones, and things like that, right? So who really benefits from these mega projects, right? Um, Anyways, despite the, uh, the, the community's feeling that they lost this battle, uh, they continue on, right? Because the struggle has been for 500 years, and a lot of people tell me if, if it takes another 500 years um, uh, for justice, and that's what they're going to do. Um, so the Yeshilas have been heavily involved in uh, the court system now. Um, <clears throat> so they used to say that the guerrillas had their guns as a weapon. Now it's laws, right? So they're trying to access courts in order to push for their rights. Um, in March 2015, uh, the communities of Quetzal became the first indigenous group in Guatemala uh, to gain a victory in, in the CC, where there, there was a resolution that stated that their rights to consultation were violated by this electrical tower company um, that built on communal land 
Uh, so this was the first time this has ever happened, right? It was a big victory. Um, unfortunately, when we went to the press conference, this was the same time when CC, this UN uh, anti-corruption watchdog, which is supported by the US and the UN, um, unveiled this corruption scandal involving high-level officials like the president, uh, Otto Perez Molina, who was forced to resign. Uh, so uh, this, this, uh, this announcement really overshadowed this legal victory. Um, and at this moment, as I speak right now, um, a lot, there's still kind of dialogue and negotiation between how um, the company who built these electrical towers are gonna rectify the situation, right? Because if you violated the rights to your prior consultation, but you already have the project there, what do you do with that, right? Um, so they're still in negotiation with that. Uh, three other Ishio communities of, of Neva actually won three court resolutions as well against Hydroelectric like Dam. So they're trying to use the courts um, to kind of push back, right? Um, lastly, and, and, I, when I, and the reason why I'm bringing this one up and the Ishio University, which I'll get in a second, is anyone who studies Guatemala knows that it's a very fatalistic situation, right? Uh, you take two steps forward, they push you three back, right? Uh, so to give an example, in 2013, uh, General Rios Montt, right, who was uh, the dictator between 1982 and 1983, was convicted of genocide uh, in May of 2013. Ten days later, the Constitutional Court overturns that, right, and, and, and annuls the ruling. Uh, he died a few months ago uh, um, during his retrial, right, um, and after he died, they actually uh, convicted the other person um, who was being charged with him for genocide, um, but he doesn't have to do any prison time, right? So the second time there was a verdict for genocide, uh, the guy who was convicted is basically free, right? So you're guilty, but go ahead. You can live out your life. Um, so again, it could be very federalistic. So the Constitutional Court uh, ruling is, um, is, is a source for hope, right? Uh, another one is youth, right? Um, so there's new generations that are coming up, um, and the Ishilas uh, uh, in 2011 create something called the Ishil University. Um, basically, uh, because of the war, there was a lot. Of, there was a wound within society. A lot of youth were getting involved in gangs. A lot of people were migrating. Um, there was still trauma that needed to be resolved, right? So alcoholism is a very serious problem, for instance, right? There's suicides and things like that. Uh, so a lot of so the ancestral leaders and uh, the elders got together and created the Ishu University. It's not recognized by the state, nor do they want to be recognized by the state, right? The purpose of the Ishu University is to focus on your territory and your community, right? So it's this kind of local level approach of understanding your reality, right? Because when we go to the educational system, we learn about Western civilization, we learn about the US, um, uh, and the educational system and the ivory tower really teach us to be embarrassed of who we are, right? Um, um, ethnic studies is uh, being threatened right now, for instance, right? So I'm not making this up, right? Um, well, anyway, so the Ishu University began in 2011. Uh, I taught there for two years, uh, and basically student fo students focus on uh, problems within the community, and they try to find solutions, right? So how, the vision is, if you are going to defend your community, you need to know everything about it, right? How many species, how the, the different species of flora and fauna, how many rivers, uh, how many spring, sources of spring water, uh, what type of trees are there, uh, what kind of companies are interested, right? So people are, uh, building this uh, Ishio consciousness, right? Um, and this is important, right? So again, 500 years of colonization, 500 years of uh, the system telling us if you're indigenous or an Indian, you're stupid, you're backwards, uh, you're lazy, you deserve to be killed, right? Um, so these types of projects, for instance, like the Ishio University, really restore dignity in oneself, right? And self-respect, right? Um, and, and, and it's needed. Um, there was a community leader that said, the river is our blood, our life, and we will never sell it. We are resisting now, and our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren remain in our place in this resistance. Again, this is a vision of, 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 la lucha is long, right? The struggle is long, right? We might not see liberation in our lifetime, right? But maybe our children will, right? Um, and I think that's a very important lesson that the Ishilas uh, have taught me, for instance, right? Uh, so with that, I know I covered a lot, so just um, if you all have any questions, um, Obviously, I'm happy to answer them, right? So thank you, gracias, eh, tantiosh. Thank you. <clears throat>